So it's my uh, one of the um, pleasures of being at a place like Stanford is part of our mission is to, uh, to is to do research is to <coughs> deliver good clinical care, but part of it is also to train our next generation of trainees. So it's really my pleasure to have young people like uh, Shumit Shah, who's a um, medical oncology fellow. He did his. Um, uh, medicine training up at UCSF and then joined Stanford as an oncology trainee. He has had um, significant interest in working with our group, I think has made a good choice, and is interested in urologic oncology. So it's really my pleasure to have him talk to us about how do we pick the best therapy for um, systemic therapy for kidney cancer. And I'd like to... Um, thank him for coming on a Saturday where he brings his little child so that they can be part of our group as well. So thanks, Shumit. Thank you very much. So uh, thank you very much to Dr. Srinivas for this uh, wonderful opportunity. Uh, like she said, my name is Samit Shah. I'm a third year oncology fellow here at Stanford. Uh, I've been very fortunate to be trained under the tutelage of Dr. Srinivas. Uh, so if, uh, if this talk do goes terribly, or if you learn nothing, you know who to direct your comments towards. <laughs> Thank you, Sandy. And I also apologize in advance. Like Dr. Srinivas said, my uh, two-year-old son's here, uh, as well as my mother. And I know that I'm 35 years old and still bring my mom to my talks. But <laughs> everyone has a number one fan, and she's mine. So... <laughs> uh, <laughs> So uh, before I actually talk about the evolving landscape of treatments for kidney cancer, uh, I should step back a bit and say that we are in a very special time in oncology. And over the last 50 years, we've seen a considerable amount of headway that has come in the form of cancer therapeutics. And I think that no one else actually describes this better than Dr. Siddhartha Mukherjee in his book, The Emperor of All Maladies. And if you haven't had a chance to check out this book, I highly recommend it to all of you history buffs out there. I think to... Uh, to gain an appreciation of where we are in cancer treatments right now, it's important to look back to where we've started. Dr. Mukherjee has essentially written very eloquently a cancer biography. Uh, and in this book, he actually talks about the four pillars of cancer therapy. Uh, the first pillar being surgery. So if you ask a surgeon what to do with something that's abnormal in the body, they're going to tell you to cut it out, right? Seems very logical. And then at the turn of the 20th century, we actually saw the rise of what we call radiation treatments. Radiation treatment using high energy beams to essentially create DNA damage and kill these rapidly dividing cells, uh, which we know as cancer. And then what happened after World War II was actually very interesting. We saw the rise of what we call chemotherapeutics, which has revo revolutionized the field of, of uh, oncology in a lot of ways. Uh, one of the first chemotherapeutics was actually nitrogen mustard gas. Uh, believe it or not, which was actually used as a weapon in World War II. What happened is that we actually saw soldiers, when they were coming back from the war, who were exposed to nitrogen mustard, have toxic effects in their bone marrow. And while that was unfortunate, a lot of researchers were thinking, hmm, that's interesting. Perhaps we can reset the bone marrow and give these patients with leukemia uh, nitrogen mustard and see if that works. And lo and behold, it did. And that gave rise to the whole field of chemotherapy and has really revolutionized the way we, we treat cancer these days. And then the last decade has actually been very exciting because we've seen this development of what we call targeted therapy. Targeted therapy has given rise in the last decade or so because of our improved understanding of the molecular pathways of, of cancer. Specifically, in kidney cancer, we know that VEGF, for instance, which is vascular endothelial growth factor, plays in a very important role in having tumors recruit and develop blood vessels, okay? So it allows the tumors to grow by developing its own blood supply. So if we were, in theory, able to develop an inhibitor or a drug to target that one VEGF receptor, we could, in fact, uh, shrink these tumors by cutting off the blood supply for these tumors. In a different pathway, we know that MET, or sorry, mTOR also plays a very important role. This is a mammalian target of raptamycin. It's a, essentially a protein that is a signal that tells the cell that it needs to replicate, okay? And if we can actually target that mTOR pathway, we know that we can actually shut down this entire process of kidney cancer. And so you probably have seen drugs like temsorolimus or everolimus, also known as affinitor, being used in this application, okay? So, uh, this is actually very reflective of this explosion of medications and therapeutics that has occurred in the last decade. 
Uh, in 2005, we saw the emergence of serafidib, which is one of our first what we call tyrosine kinase inhibitors, or one of these targeted agents that we're using. Uh, and then Sutent, which is a medication that many of you may have been on in the past or on currently as a first-line agent for uh, metastatic kidney cancer. Okay, When kidney cancer has actually left the kidney and gone to other parts of the body, we typically use Sutent. Or another drug, you, you, which you may be familiar with, is Pazopinib or Votriant, which was FDA approved in 2010. Okay, So there have been a number of targeted agents over the last decade. And even in the last six months, we've actually seen two new medications that were just approved. One was cabozantinib just a few months back, and then as little as two months ago, we saw the FDA approval of levantinib with everolimus. So it's, a, it's actually a very exciting time, uh, and compared to many other c cancers, we actually feel that we're very fortunate to have so many weapons in our armamentarium to attack kidney cancer. So this is uh, actually, we, feel, we, we do feel that in some ways this is a luxury. Now, going back to our analogy of the four pillars, uh, so we talked about surgery, radiation, chemotherapy, and then most recently, targeted therapy in the last decade. But now, we're actually in a very new, brand new era of, of, of oncology, and it's extremely exciting. Actually, a lot of the gray hairs from Stanford are actually staving off retirement just to come back into the game. And uh, even my son is excited about this. <laughs> uh, and, and, and because of this brand new uh, field of what we call immunotherapy, right? And I'm sure you've all heard about this in the past, but we're all ex incredibly excited about where this platform can take kidney cancer over the next decade or so. In fact, the uh, immunologist, uh, the, the leader of immunology at Johns Hopkins was quoted as saying, I have such confidence in the potential of immunotherapy that I think the years from 2010 to 2015 will be looked at historically as the time that immunotherapy became the fifth pillar of cancer treatment. Okay? So there's a, there's a lot of hope, there's a lot of uh, expectations on what we can do with this type of therapy. So what exactly is immunotherapy? Uh, so there, I think there's a lot of a lot of different answers to this question. Uh, you know, is it vaccine therapy? Is it cell adoptive therapy? There are a lot of ways to answer this. My simple, salu my simple answer when patients ask me is that I say that it's a way for the body to harness the power of the immune system to fight cancer, okay? So we're using the, uh, we're using the power of the immune system to fight cancer in a way that we haven't been able to do before, okay? Uh, and a lot of people think actually that a lot of people think that this is a brand new concept, that this is something that was just developed in the last couple years. There are all these fancy drugs out there. There's all these fancy ads that you see on TV. But in fact, the origins of uh, immunotherapy started much earlier, actually back in 1891. Okay? And it started with this man, Dr. William Coley, uh, who was an oncologist who dealt with this cancer, soft tissue sarcoma. Okay? And uh, Dr. Coley noticed that the vast majority of his patients were dying, unfortunately. But when he actually went through the charts of his patients, he noticed something actually pretty intriguing. There was a couple of patients who actually exceeded expectations and lived much longer than they should have. Okay? Back then, in the 1890s, the average expectancy for someone who was uh, with uh, advanced sarcoma would probably live two to three months at the most. And these patients were actually living on beyond a year, and some of them were actually cured of their disease. So he was looking through the charts and actually came across something that was actually very interesting about these patients. He noticed that each of these patients who lived a lot longer than what was supposed to, each, had, well, each contracted an infection with this bug called Streptococcus pyogenes. And then what happened later was even more interesting is that all these patients actually developed a facial rash called erysipelas. And so Dr. Coley was thinking, hmm, though this is interesting. All the patients that did well developed this facial rash, and their tumors actually started to go away. So he had one of two hypotheses. One is that this bacteria, Streptococcus biology, is actually killing the cancer cells, which we now probably know is probably not the case. Or his second hypothesis is that because of this facial rash, we've actually essentially woken up a dormant immune system. Okay? And now this immune system is revved up, ready to go and fight something, and it happens to actually fight this cancer. So what's the next most logical step that Dr. Coley did? Well, you go out there and start injecting patients with Streptococcus pyogenes, of course, so, uh, which is actually very interesting. He actually started doing this in 1899, and they called this Coley's toxins, where he would actually take a vial of Streptococcus pyogenes and inject it into patients' veins. So the good thing is that he actually saw, remarkably, regressions of these tumors. So these tumors started to actually shrink, and people no longer died of their sarcoma. The bad part is that they started dying of Streptococcus pyogenes infection, though. <laughs> 
So, but <laughs> regardless, it was at that time in the 1890s, kind of the dawning of the uh, era of immunotherapy. So that's really where we attribute a lot of the origins of immunotherapy, and we, we now attribute Dr. Coley as kind of the father of, of the field. Uh, now our understanding of immunotherapy with modern day science is a lot more mature than that, of course. We do understand that there are relationships between the immune system and cancer. So this is a group of patients who, were, uh, who, who have undergone a kidney transplant, okay? So after a tr kidney transplant, you're on medications to suppress your immune system, so you're effectively immunosuppressed. The reason we do that is because we don't want your immune system to reject your new kidney that you just received. However, if we follow out these kidney, uh, these kidney transplant patients for 20 years, we see that they also carry a significant risk of cancers. And you also see this in HIV patients and other immunocompromised patients, okay? So in this graph here, you can see that the risk of developing skin cancer, lymphoma, or sarcoma is 20-fold higher if you are a kidney transplant patient who is on immunosuppression, which is actually quite interesting. The, the, the risk of developing kidney cancer is also 15-fold higher for patients who are immunosuppressed. So we do know that there is this balance between the immune system and developing cancer. And the hope is now that we can then harness that fact and use the immune system to cure cancer in the same regards. So actually, one of the first therapies that was used uh, back in the 1960s of immunotherapy was happened to be actually in kidney cancer, and that's with IL-2. Uh, I don't know if there may have been a handful of you that have actually had this therapy in the past. Uh, and this is actually, at the time, was an extremely exciting, exciting drug. So IL-2 is a type of cytokine or an immune modulator. And what it does is actually non-specifically kind of uh, accelerates or revs up the immune system. It's not cancer specific, like some of the things that we have today potentially, but it is just kind of a general uh, booster of the immune system, maybe liking it to something that you would get a Jamba Juice when they put it into your milkshake. Um, but on steroids though, so. Uh, but this was a very exciting drug back in the, in the 1970s. And when we actually gave this to patients with kidney cancer, with advanced kidney cancer, we saw something miraculous. So this is a Kaplan-Meier plot, and you may have seen a few of these throughout the day, but essentially the takeaway is that the higher the up you are on the curve, the better you are, okay? On the y-axis there is the proportion of patients who are surviving over time, and on the x-axis this is survival in years, and this goes all the way out to 20 years. And you can see that there is one group of patients, 20 patients out of the 250 that they looked at, that surviving for 20 years after IL-2 therapy. And this is with advanced disease. And so these patients all had a, what's called a complete response, meaning that their tumors completely vanished after giving them IL-2 therapy. And uh, so 20, 20 patients out of 250 is around 10%. So you're getting a 10% cure rate with, uh, with, 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 for metastatic disease, which is still, even to this day, pretty much unheard of, right? None of the therapies that we have is actually could give you a 10% therapy even to this day. But, and th back in the 70s and 80s, there was multiple case reports going out as IL-2 being the cure for kidney cancer. Uh, you can see here on your left that there is a large tumor in the uh, patient's liver, okay? The uh, darkened area in the, in the, in the liver there. And then you can see after a few weeks of IL-2 therapy that that liver lesion completely disappears. So back then, again, it was thought as maybe this is the big breakthrough that we've been looking for. The problem with IL-2, though, is that it's extremely toxic to the body. So we actually give it extremely rarely uh, even today, unfortunately. There are ways, we're trying to figure out ways to make it a little bit more amenable to, uh, safer for patients, but unfortunately it's very, very, very toxic. So the patients who actually get it tend to be very young, very healthy, very fit, and with very good kidney function. And even then, we tend to give it in the intensive care unit just because the risk of mortality is so high from the treatment itself. So we're hoping that we can figure out ways to make this a little bit safer drug, but right now we typically don't use this that very often, especially in our patient population, which tends to be a little bit older. Uh, so fast forward now, so that was back in the 1970s, the, the landscape of a cancer immunotherapy is very, very different than it was even 30 years ago. Uh, there's a lot of buzz about it, and you probably have seen a lot of this in the news. It's on the cover of Newsweek. It's on the cover of Time Magazine. Uh, even our former presidents have had immunotherapy, which is quite remarkable. You may know that Jimmy Carter was recently diagnosed with metastatic melanoma. Uh, so he actually had melanoma skin cancer that had gone not only from his skin, but also to his lungs and to his brain. Now, reportedly, we, we don't treat Dr. And Mr. Carter, but... Uh, uh, he reportedly has gone into complete remission after immunotherapy. 
Uh, he's been on several cycles of therapy, and now even his brain metastases have even completely cleared, which is which is pretty much uh, uh, very, very rare to hear in any, any patient, but this is really remarkable, though. So there's a lot of hype about where we can go with this type of therapy. Um, this date, uh, November 23rd, 2015, turns out to be a very important date in kidney cancer for patients with advanced disease, because this was the date that this drug, nivolumab Opdivo, was FDA approved. Okay, uh, and you may have also seen all the ads of Opdivo. Uh, Bishop Mollers likes to put these all over billboards all over San Francisco, so you may have seen these. This chance to live longer, so to speak. Um, but you know, the big question is like, what does nivolumab actually do, and how does it actually work? Okay, so I don't know if a lot of you have uh, I've had the opportunity to learn a little bit about how nivolumab works, but I thought I would give you a slight introduction today. So as opposed to talking directly about nivolumab uh, initially, what I'll do is give you a little primer on immunology 101, which you may remember from your grade school days. Um, so I'll give you an example. So what exactly happens when you get the flu, right? So you, you get the flu, you take some chicken noodle soup, you take a little bit of honey water and lemon water, or whatever your mom told you to take when you're 10 years old, and everything gets better within two weeks, right? You're back on your feet, you go back to work, you didn't take any IV medications, you didn't take any chemotherapeutics, and all of a sudden, your body figured out what to do, right? So what was actually happening? So it turns out that you have these T cells that are floating around your body, right? These T cells are your natural defense mechanism against anything, any foreign substance, right? And they're just waiting to kill something. And so what happens is that it needs to be told what to kill. So what does that then? So then you have what's called these antigen presenting cells in green here. So these antigen presenting cells are going around the body looking for foreign substances. So this antigen presenting cell will find a piece of flu molecule or, or uh, a little bit of the flu and will we'll gobble that up and present it to this antigen or to this T cell. And once it actually engages with this T cell, you have what's called an activated T cell. And now you have a programmed killing machine. It is going around the body looking for the flu and will, will kill it wherever it finds it. That's pretty remarkable, right? And now the, the big question is, why doesn't this work in cancer, right? Shouldn't your body recognize that you have kidney cancer, have a little particle go up to these T cells, activate them, and then fight the cancer? That's exactly what it should do, right? But why isn't it doing that? Well, there was a big discovery that was made just um, in the last decade, which has actually been quite intriguing, and we found that cancer has actually developed this white flag, and it's waving this white flag and basically telling this, the immune system, I'm one of you guys, don't eat me, okay? So th these cancers, unfortunately, are very, very smart. So uh, this, this white flag happens to be called PDL1. So PDL1 is the white flag on these tumor cells that's basically it's a way to evade the immune system, right? So when your immune cells come in, it engages with the immune system, with the, with the tumor cell, and what does the tumor cell tell the, uh, the immune system? It says, don't eat me, okay? So it's essentially saying, don't eat me, don't attack me, I'm one of you guys. So then how does nivolumab come in and, and work against this uh, process? So nivolumab then comes in and targets this interaction between the tumor cell and the immune cell, okay? Between PDL1 and what's called PD1. And it blocks that interaction, effectively lowering this white flag. So the white flag is now lowered, and you've taken this invisible cloak off of cancer, and you're now changing that don't eat me signal and reversing it into an eat me signal. <laughs> and then what, do you, what happens next is then you have these immune cells come in and gobble up that tumor cell, right? So that's actually the, how nivolumab works, which is actually really interesting. But now you're thinking, well, that's great, doc. Um, uh, but does this actually work, right? Does it actually work in patients? So that's the big question. And, uh, you know, we're fortunate at Stanford to be a you know, very evidence-based uh, research institution. So we were part of this trial as well. Um, and Dr. Srinivas was as well, I should say. Uh, as part of, this, part of this trial looking at uh, a phase three randomized trial of nivolumab versus everolimus. Okay, this is called the Checkmate 25 trial. And it was a big landmark trial for kidney cancer. Uh, and they were taking patients who were with advanced kidney cancer, and there were about 800 of them. Four of the, 400, 400 of them they put into a group that was getting the immunotherapy, nivolumab, and they were getting uh, a dose every two weeks. And then the other, uh, the other uh, group was uh, getting everolimus, which is one of those targeted therapies that I was discussing earlier, and they were getting that daily every day, okay? And then they looked to see how these patients do over time. So they look over the next uh, several months and years to see how they, how they do. 
Uh, so you should know that whenever you're thinking about clinical trial, you should always ask yourself, am I the type of patient that would have been on this clinical trial, right? Because in the end, this clinical trial only applies to the patients it represents. So who are these patients? So these are patients who are median age of 62 years old, okay? So our, which is about average for uh, kidney cancer. So it is representative of our patient population that we see here at Stanford. The uh, performance status for these patients was 90% on a scale of 1 to 100, okay, which means that these were relatively fit, robust patients that were doing well, pretty healthy. So if you're feeling really, really sick and not be able to get about out of bed, probably not the best drug for you potentially. Uh, and all these patients did have prior uh, therapy. So they had been on Sutent, they had been on Pazopinib, they had tried Accentinib. Uh, so they had been on prior therapy. And again, please remember that these are patients who have had advanced cancers, uh, either metastatic, uh, uh, to, largely metastatic tumors though, okay? And so what happened with the uh, overall survival here? Uh, well, this is another Kaplan-Meier curve. Uh, looking at uh, uh, patients on the top line is nivolumab, and the, and the yellow line is uh, everolimus, and you can see that there is separation between the curves. Again, uh, the y-axis here is the proportion of patients who are surviving, and the x-axis is time and months, and you can uh, see that there is a difference between how each group does. And uh, we do have a rule of thumb in oncology, and it's called the rule of thumb. What you do is actually you take your thumb and see if you can put it in between the two lines. All right, and if you can't fit your thumb in between lines, the, the drug's probably not worth its lick. But in this situation, I think you can actually say that, you know, that you can put your thumb, your thumb in between those lines. So there is an overall difference. But was that? It's a big screen. It's a big screen. It, does, it does kind of depend on what, what kind of screen you have. But you can, put your, uh, you can put your thumb there and say, hey, there is a difference. And I think more importantly, though, is that we're starting to see this tail potentially diverge even more. Okay, now we're starting to see that if you respond to uh, immunotherapy, you actually have a very prolonged response. And so if we look at the objective response rate, so what are the chances you'll even have some kind of response to this therapy? You see that in 25% 25 uh, of patients with nivolumab, they were getting a response, meaning that they were either getting stable disease or potentially regression of the tumors, or in very few instances, 1% of patients, they were actually getting a complete response, meaning they were disease-free after getting nivolumab, okay? So that's good, okay, because if you look on the other column, everolimus, there were only 5% of responders there, right? So the thing is, we're only getting right now, though, 25% of patients to respond to this therapy. So the big question is, how do we get that 25 into 85 into 95 into 100, right? That's eventually the goal, but right now we feel that this is potentially a good platform Platform. So what are the side effects of these uh, me medications, right? Like we talked about IL-2 before being too toxic. Do we see the same kind of toxicity profile in nivolumab? Well, not quite, actually. It's actually, in, the, in general, pretty well tolerated. So we see that in 80% of patients that there was some type of uh, uh, side effect that they were having. 20% of patients actually had no side effects. And uh, the most common side effect was fatigue in about a third of patients. Uh, rash was seen in 10% of patients. Pneumonitis or inflammation of the lungs was seen in 4% uh, of patients. And anemia, uh, which is lowering of your blood counts, was seen in a handful of patients as well. But this is actually very much in parallel with what we know about immunotherapy in general, right? Because if, if you imagine, basically what we've done is taking the brakes off the immune system, right? We're letting, we're letting the immune system run rampant. So you can imagine that it's not only attacking cancer, but now it's potentially ta targeting other parts of your body, right? So it's not completely uh, unreasonable that you might have effects of what we call autoimmunity. So pH patients can get hypothyroidism, they can get hepatitis or inflammation of the liver, you can have adrenal insufficiency, or or uh, de decreased amount of hormone and steroid that you're putting out, so you may have to be on steroid replacement. You can have rashes, pneumonitis, which I said before, which is inflammation of the lungs, and you can also have colitis, which is inflammation of your colon, which is manifested typically by diarrhea. So these are all side effects that are seen, but in general, I would say reasonably well tolerated, though. So the next question is, how long do you actually treat for? Which I think is actually one of the most interesting questions that has been asked in the last year. So it's very different than the way that we actually treat for chemotherapy, okay? In chemotherapy, we actually treat for a certain amount of time, and after eight weeks, we get a CT scan, right? And the CT scan was if we see progression or enlargening of these tumors, we stop therapy and we think about giving you something else. But in immunotherapy, we actually think about Go, uh, if you actually progress after eight weeks, meaning if these tumors look larger, 
we actually may still keep on going, okay? And uh, this was actually looked at when we looked at that old trial that we had, I just talked about just a few minutes ago. There were a number of patients who were treated beyond progression. Again, they were treated even though their CT scan showed enlargening on the CT scan, okay? And the reason why we do this is, is because of a phenomenon called pseudoprogression. So what is pseudoprogression? So pseudoprogression, uh, well, I'll start with actually regular disease progression, which is the traditional model. So it's what I was saying before, you, get, you have a baseline tumor, eight weeks later, the tumor grows, and then eight weeks after that, if you check again, it grows again. And now you have, you have, you're absolutely sure that this tumor is growing, and you take them off therapy, put them on something else. On the first, on the first row, you see pseudoprogression. So that's your original tumor, and then eight weeks later, you actually, if you get a CT scan or a PET scan, you see growth on, these, on the CT scan. But the issue in this situation is that ne doesn't necessarily represent tumor. It could also re represent immune infiltration. So those immune cells that we discussed earlier are now infiltrating the tumor and make it appear bigger, but it's actually not bigger. So if you keep on treating eight weeks later, you actually may see a regression of your tumor. Okay, so it's a, it's a possibility. We're still not in the ex days of the exact science of what do we know whether to keep on treating beyond progression or not. We we try to if we can. Sometimes uh, the, the tumors get overwhelmingly big after after uh, after eight weeks, and we feel that maybe this is not safe to keep on going. So there's a lot of judgment right now, uh, but it is a little bit of a slippery slope. But there is this concept that you could do this, and this is actually proven by data as well. So this is a, a waterfall plot, which is, I think is a little bit tough to uh, interpret if you've never seen one of these before. But essentially, there there is the the zero axis there, and all of these blue lines represent patients. And if the bar goes up, that means that their tumors have actually gotten bigger after they've already progressed. Okay, these are all patients who have had progression at one point in the past, and now the next time point, you're seeing what happened to their, to their tumor size. And you can see all those patients on the left there, their tumors actually did grow, so they would be taking off therapy. But all these patients on the right side, you can see, actually had a response. So their tumors actually shrank despite them growing earlier. And you can say about 15% of these patients, they've had about over a 30% reduction of their tumors um, despite progressing earlier, which is actually quite uh, intriguing, though. Again, this is very, very different than we've ever treated uh, with regular chemotherapeutics. So where do we go from here? Uh, so I think that one of the... Um, <laughs> so. They just pick Saturday, so at least I hope we all feel that our institution is safe and they are doing periodic tests. That's right. But it's really not a true alarm, so we can continue. Yeah. Okay. What's that? Yeah, th this talk is on fire. That's right. Um, so, um, the <laughs> so the uh, the combination uh, trial. Thank you. Uh, the, uh, the, the next directions, I think, are in combination therapies. So we're going to be using multiple of these immune checkpoint inhibitors, which was, uh, which was as I was alluding to earlier. So it turns out there's not just PDL1. We talked about PDL1 being or earlier, or PD1, uh, being a way to escape the immune system, right? But it turns out there's multiple white flags that cancer has, not just one. So it's very, very tricky. There are also many what we call activating receptors that these immune systems have. So these are ways, if you can actually stimulate the immune system, another way to actually encourage the immune system to fight cancer. So there's, there's uh, inhibitory pathways and also stimulating pathways. And now we're trying to figure out, can we mix and match the drugs that we have to see if we can do even more than what we've done before, right? So we're trying to mix and match like these PD-1 inhibitors like nivolumab with potentially a CD27 uh, receptor on the other side, which actually stimulates the uh, immune system. System. So we're actually doing this here at Stanford. Dr. Srinivas, Dr. Srinivas and I myself are involved in this clinical trial where we're looking at an anti-CD27 antibody to stimulate the immune system. And then nivola, in combination with nivolumab, which, which, which we de just discussed, as a way to take away this inhibitory effect of the immune system, right? And so we're now we're using this in combination to see if we can use two immune drugs to further enhance the immune system, which is very exciting. Uh, potentially up the uh, pipeline as well as vaccine therapy, right? So you may have heard of vaccine therapy. Uh, vaccines in cancer are a little bit different from the vaccines that you get when you go to Walgreens or your primary care physician for the flu. Uh, you, you, these don't necessarily prevent cancer in this uh, uh, the way it's being used right now. This would be for patients who have actually already have cancer. So what we do in this situation is a personalized vaccine approach. Uh, and this is actually for a company that we may be working with in the future. We don't know. Uh, and you would actually take a biopsy of 
uh, the patient's tumor. So you take it, the patient's tumor, biopsy it, and sequence it, okay? So you get the genomic library of what actually is composed of that tumor. And then you actually look to see if there are certain neoantigens or uh, uh, particles or um, proteins that are specific to that cancer that the immune system can recognize. So you sequence it, you find out what makes that cancer so unique about your cancer, and then you make a vaccine out of that and put it back into the body. So now your, your immune system can figure out, hey, that's a bad guy. I need to go figure out where all the other bad guys are too, and it starts to destroy the cancer. So that's called a personalized vaccine approach, and that will be in the pipeline as well. Okay? So uh, that was a little primer about immunotherapy. Uh, I mean, there's a lot you could talk about about cancer uh, therapeutics, and I think that for our purposes, I kind of wanted to focus on immunotherapy just because it's such a, you know, in the news these days and a very, you know, hot topic. Um, so just to kind of recap about what we talked about is that, you know, we've made enormous progress over the last several decades, but in, in the last decade with between targeted therapy and uh, immunotherapy, and I think the future is incredibly bright for, uh, for kidney cancer. Uh, we know now that the immune system and cancer have this very close and dynamic relationship. Uh, and that cancer may arise because of weak, we, uh, weaknesses in the immune system, but potentially can be cured if you can strengthen the immune system. We know that immunotherapy, such as the checkpoint inhibitors that I talked about earlier, such as nivolumab, uh, do work very, very successfully in a subset of patients. So we know that 25% of patients will respond, and those patients, those patients may have a very prolonged response, which is quite remarkable. The question is, how do we increase that 25%? Um, and now, you know, the question is, how do we use these immunotherapies in different settings? So right now, we're using it in metastatic patients, right, when the cancer is spread outside the kidney. But can we use it in the adjuvant setting, meaning after you've had your surgery, can we give you immunotherapy? Or potentially, can we use it as maintenance? So if you do have metastatic cancer and we give you and you have a very good response to Sutent or or Votriant, instead of taking that toxic drug all the time, could you be on immunotherapy and maybe have a prolonged response with that? You know, these are all ideas floating around that need to be tested. And then the next steps, as I talked about, will be combination trials, mix and matching these different immunomodulatory uh, agents, uh, potentially these vaccine studies. And then I think a very big uh, 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 you know, concept that's coming out right now is we need a very reliable bar biomarker to determine who's actually responding to immunotherapy, right? So it'd be nice to know if I take you know, Mrs. Smith's blood and see a biomarker in there that says that she would actually be susceptible to this type of treatment, then I'll be more inclined to be giving it, right? And so we need to start developing, you know, uh, a better way of, of uh, triaging patients to know who should get immunotherapy and who, who shouldn't because we think it may not work, okay? So um, that's what I have for today. I wanted to also thank all our patients. Uh, we really are indebted to all of you. I think, you know, the field has grown so much because of, of your courage and your brave bravery. And, and, and every day I come into work uh, incredibly inspired. Uh, so I do thank you all for uh, giving me a lot of meaning to, to what I do every day. So, thanks. <laughs>、uh, any questions? Right, right here.、Um, couple of quick questions at the back. So yes, yes. Really short. Hi.、Um, so, when you looked at the response to the drug uh, uh, Abdivo, Nivolumab,、yeah, yes. was there any correlation between tumor grade and the response? One. And two, You talked about patient selection and biomarkers. How do you push drug companies to actually invest money in uh, uh, developing companion diagnostics and biomarkers instead of jumping to first develop the drug? That's a good question. So, you know, so in these immunotherapy trials,、um, they didn't necessarily actually take a look at grade per se. I mean, it was looked at, but it wasn't the one thing that actually had a big. Uh, effect. They did see that patients with a,、uh, a poor performance status, or I guess who had a, a worse prognosis, which does include grade, end up doing better with immunotherapy. So that's known. But the big question was、uh, does the expression of PDL1, this protein, the, the amount of that expression actually determine how you respond, right? So they actually looked at patients who had more than 5% expression of PDL1 on their tumors and less than 1% expression of PDL1 on their tumors. And they actually、uh, Realized that there was no difference. It wasn't predictive, okay? It was somewhat prognostic, but it wasn't predictive of how you would do a treatment. So we're still not quite there yet. And, I, and to answer your second question, actually, there is,、uh, for, the, for the pharmaceutical companies, I mean, that is a big field in itself. Uh, they are all trying to figure out how to make a predictive biomarker. What they want to do is make a predictive biomarker so that you can use their drug to do this.、So、there's actually a big market for it. The problem is, is that no one's actually panned out 
to have a very good biomarker. So one, you know, a, a Bristol Myers PDL1 expression assay may be very different from Merck's, and it's just, there's still a lot of uh, to be done in, in developing a, an accurate one. So nothing's really accurate, and that actually may be reflective of the fact that PDL1 is also a very dynamic process. So when you actually biopsy that tumor. At that time, your PD-1 expression may be very different than the time when you're actually getting treatment. And so it's not as static as we once thought as well. So I think it's a lot more challenging than we initially understood. And so I think we still have some homework to do. Any other questions? Yeah, please. On the clinical trials, a lot of times they exclude rare types of kidney yeah. cancers, and also the immunotherapies and all the drugs that they don't seem his cancer doesn't seem to respond to any. Right. What, what, what do you do at that point? Yeah. I mean, you just kind of try them and hope because there's there's like zero data on this right. type right. of cancer. Right. No, right. I I do think it's very very difficult when you have a rare tumor to get into some of these larger trials because what they're trying to do also is show just like we were showing that they're like each. Each age group in each each group of patients was 62. What they're trying to do is balance these groups out so that way you have uh, a homogeneity between the groups. And if you have some patients, some groups with you know rare types of uh, uh, cancers, they may re respond differently. And they're just trying to make the groups as equal as possible. I completely with, agree with you. I feel that these patients should all be included personally. But I think that um, uh, in general, I think that you know immunotherapy for right now is FDA approved for kidney cancer, you know? So I think that it's a possibility that we can actually use it in the certain setting, after a uh, first-line setting, uh, for kidney cancer regardless of, the, uh, re regardless of the indication. The one thing about that is, though, is that we know that it may not always work either, though, okay? That from that we, what we've seen in other types of tumors that are similar uh, to kidney cancer, uh, that immunotherapy may not be efficacious. Dr. Srinivas, did you want to so add? So I just want to say that the National Cancer Institute, you know, uh, has come to recognize that for rare tumors, how do we get them a novel drug? And this has been a challenge because in order for a drug to be approved, we need like 1,000 patients to be part of it. So as part of this whole cancer initiative, the National Cancer Institute has a trial called the MATCH trial. So they'll take people with rare malignancies and they'll have their blood drawn or their tumor typed and if there is an abnormal mutation that your particular tumor might have, you might not have access to a drug, but via this match trial, they'll be able to match your mutation to a drug, provided your cancer has that mutation. So even if we can find a specific trial just for your cancer type, at least there is a, a, a resource right now that should your cancer have an abnormal mutation, they'll be able to link you with this um, appropriate target. So we certainly have that trial open here at Stanford. There are many academic institutions that are part of this match uh, um, initiative, so that might be one way around it. Yes. So, Sumit, I have a question about uh, immunotherapy in general. It mm -hmm. seems like a lot of the immunotherapies are started in melanoma and then they come out to other areas. And yeah. there seems like definitely different efficacy in melanoma versus uh, kidney That's cancer. Right. Are there any efforts to kind of uh, personalize or at least specific get specific immunotherapies for specific types of cancer, or is that still going to be the way it's going to happen? No, it's a very interesting question, and it's, it's an astute observation. So a lot of these immunotherapy trials are done in melanoma first because we know that, in general, melanoma is actually a very immunogenic tumor, so it's actually responsive to immunotherapy. So why is that? So it turns out if you look at the actual amount of mutational burden in melanoma, it's actually very different than a lot of other cancers. It's very, very, very high. So we know that because of all this prolonged sun exposure that causes melanoma, or for smokers that, are, uh, that cause uh, lung cancer, there's a lot of mutations that are occurring, right? And so these mutations are essentially developing these neoantigens, or basically it's more ways for the immune system to latch on and see the cancer, right? So these, these types of cancers that have what, what we call a more of a mutational burden actually are better, are more immunogenic, and they tend to respond better. So in terms of why, why melanoma first, I think it's because it's so, you know, immunogenic, Two is that drug companies obviously want to go towards something that actually works so they can kind of move things along. So that's the main reason, though. Uh, what's that? 
Oh, so then going back to well, so kidney cancer itself has also been found to be very immunogenic, though. Uh, it also has a very high mutational load, and uh, it does respond uh, very well to immunotherapy. So I think that you know a lot of these trials will now be coming out, and we'll start having some at Stanford as well. But uh, I would say in general, uh, everyone wants to do stuff in kidney cancer right now. Um, that it is a very hot subject, and you know uh, we're, we're very fortunate in that regard. We have companies coming in all the time trying to figure out you know can they work with our patients because it is a great opportunity. So I think you know in terms of though, if you talk to a drug company, I think what everyone is looking at right now is melanoma, potentially uh, smoking lung cancer, uh, renal cell carcinoma, and bladder cancer are, are, are four of the biggest ones. So uh, we're very fortunate to be dealing with two of those. So yeah, I, th I think this will be a big, a big thing in kidney cancer. To that, to that point, you know, I mean, unlike other, previously we used to have specific chemotherapy for lung cancer, specific chemotherapy for bladder cancer. We don't treat them the same. But one of the beauties here is that our body, every one of us have an immune system. Mm -hmm. So right now, nivolumab or other checkpoint inhibitors appear to work in lung cancer. They work in melanoma. They work in head and neck cancer. Right now, they are being worked at in breast cancer. So I think in the next decade, what we want to see is how can we manipulate a kidney cancer patient's immune system so that it works 100% of the time? And such technologies have already come in where they're able to remove your lymphocytes and genetically um, engineer it so that and put it back into the body so that it goes and fights the cancer cells. Those are called chimeric antigen receptors right now. It's called CAR technology. And they have gone forward with uh, hematologic malignancies like leukemias are now given this and patients are in complete remission. But that technology is being looked at in solid tumors, including kidney cancer. Mm -hmm. Yes. How much research and who is doing research on what uh, cripples the immune system in the first place to become weak? Yeah, to, uh, it's, yeah. It's, a, it's, a, it's a great question. Uh, you know, the basic scientists are certainly looking at this. Uh, there are theories, everything from potentially this is even viruses causing this uh, to, you know, we, we don't know exactly. But you know, I think that there, there does need to be a lot of work into why these immunodeficiencies happen. Um, I would say right now it's not quite well known um, but why all these mutations happen. Uh, but there is a lot of work being put into it, and we're just not quite there yet. Yeah. So neutrophil to lymphocyte ratio, I mean, it is being looked at and in kidney cancer also. Those are more prognostic. They don't help us predict whether a treatment is going to work or not. Right now, all of those just tell us that somebody is going to do better or worse. So thank you. I'd like to thank Shumit. It's been an awesome talk. Thank you.